Hello, everyone. Welcome to FluentCon. I'm Matt Lehman. I'm an engineer at Gray Noise. Hi, and I'm Guillermo Menjivar, an, an, an engineer at Gray Noise as well. So uh, today we're here to talk to you about noise canceling headphones for FluentBit powered by Lua. And I'm uh, going to give a quick outline about what uh, we're going to chat about today. Just kind of set expectations there. Uh, first thing is uh, Guillermo is going to talk about what is Gray Noise. Uh, I'm going to jump into what, you know, gray, how gray noise uses FluentBit internally uh, for our framework. Uh, Guillermo is going to talk a little bit about a hell world, uh, how to write a hello world uh, Lua filter. And then I'm going to jump into the gray noise Lua filter and a real quick demo. And at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. So uh, Guillermo is going to tell you a little bit about gray noise now. Great. So yeah. So what is gray noise? So gray noise tells you what not to worry about. And the best way to think about is think about any server that you have that is publicly facing and it has a SSH open. And then you jump onto this, your, the terminal and you open that file and you look at all these random IPs probing your server. And then you ask like, well, are they attacking me? Are they a threat to me? Are they hacking me? And there are many things that happen in the internet, right? Like the internet is super noisy place. So you have opportunistic uh, internet, internet scanner, scanning uh, devices or common business services. Like think about it, Googlebot, Bing. Um, so they're not really a target to you. So a great news focus on like what to tell you, what not to worry about. So it helps you focus on what matters most by filtering out the noise. So that is what great news does. It allows you to, um, yeah, look at, look at data and look at your logs, move away the noise, Focus on those targets, or those threats that actually do affect you. And uh, yeah. Great. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we use FluentBit at Gray Noise. Um, and so FluentBit plays a pretty big role for us here. Uh, we have about a thousand sensors and growing every day um, for us. And for sensors, that's uh, largely just a, a honeypot framework for us. Um, and so we have a global footprint with that framework. Uh, we're in just about every country you could imagine, um, across every provider you could imagine, and we have a hardware agnostic approach there. So we might be in a cloud provider, uh, in a VPS, in a dedicated piece of hardware at a data center, or it could be even as something as small as like a Raspberry Pi. Um, and so on all of those different pieces of hardware in all of those different places uh, of the world, we're running a collection of open source and closed source software. And we have various um, different profiles of those sensors that we run. And the one thing all of those things have in common, both with the open and closed source software is they all output to log files. And so what we needed to be able to do is figure out, okay, how can we combine all of these various weird log files into some common schema that has meaning to us um, and that we can use to provide value into some sort of data set? And so the way we looked at that is we were like, okay, well, now we need to figure out how can we um, at, you know, on each one of these centers, sensors, filter, transform, and validate um, this common schema and the logs coming out of those various open and closed source software. And then finally, route the events out to our data lake so that we can do um, various different types of processing, data science, et cetera, and get those into a format where uh, ultimately they land in a data store where we can put an API in front of them and provide value to our users. And so Guillermo is going to tell you a little bit about uh, FluentBit filter. Great. So in order for us to really understand or oh, oh, catch the idea of a FluentBit filter, uh, we need to understand kind of like the ecosystem of the pipeline that FluentBit makes available to us, right? So in its context, we have like an input, parser, filter, buffer, and then routing, right? So, and so, in that pipeline, the filter plays the role of transformation, right? So you can tra transform an event that comes in or you can drop an event. So it allows you to do uh, intelligent decisions uh, based on some criteria that the event uh, uh, has or meets. Now, the, while Plumbe allows you to do basic filters, that its power really comes by use, by uh, combining uh, Plumbe with the Lua jet that it makes available to you. That's where you know, we can write a, a bit more advanced uh, logic to make determinations of certain criteria the event does, and then maybe drop it or maybe transform it uh, and pass it down to the buffer and then eventually the routing mechanism. 
So cool. So with that in mind, we we're gonna now write the very simple hello world Lua filter. But before we even start writing our code, we actually need to configure Fluentbit to actually use our Lua filter. Now, so if you remember we mentioned about that pipeline. In the context of the Fluentbit, we're gonna look at three steps, which is the input, the filter, and then the output. Now the input in this, for, for our example, we're gonna use this dummy, really super handy uh, mock uh, input that Fluentbit allows you to, to allows you to use. And as you can tell in line four, you just generate some random message. And then you actually can tell it how the frequency of it um, being emitted per second. Now, for our example, it's important to catch the, we, it's a key value, right? So it's first value, hello, second value, world. Uh, what we're really interested in is the filter stanza. And here the name is actually the type of filter that we want Fluentbit to use, which is Lua. Um, the match is the, the flag, the tag that we actually assign in line three. Um, line nine tells you, tells Fluentbit where to find the script. And then line 10 tells it within the script, I need you to call the function handler. And then the output just, it could be sender out, but for our, you know, for our example, we're just gonna use the uh, unlock file. Um, cool. So now, now that we have Fluentbit configured, right? So now it's ready to be used. This is the this is how simple a Lua filter looks like. If you written any AWS Lambda, this would look very very familiar. And the reason is because there's a predefined set of inputs that you take in, predefined set of outputs that we expect from you. So the tag is the the tag associated with the record. The timestamp is the timestamp of the arrival of the event in the Fluentbit framework and in the record itself. Now, it, if you remember from the example from the input, the dummy input, we got first value, second value. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna transform this event through this, through our hello world Lua filter. So as you can tell here, the new record, full value will be the first value plus some spacing and then the second value, which should give us the hello world. And then now we're gonna return it. Now, there's something to say about the return as well. Now, okay, yeah, perfect. So it's key to know the caveats of the code that we return. This is how our Lua filter communicates with the greater Fluentbit framework. So if you return a negative one, that means that you're telling, your Lua filter is telling Fluentbit to actually drop that record. If you, if you return a zero, you're telling it that while you might have peaked at the record, you actually didn't modify it. And then if you return a one, it means that you actually transformed the event. So something actually changed as we did ourselves here. So the cool thing here is that there's a very simple yet elegant way for your, your Lua filter to communicate with the greater um, Fluentbit record. I mean, Fluentbit framework, sorry. So now there's, because we're taking this it be usually if, we're, if you are going to write a Lua filter, you are gonna deploy it to your production servers. So we, like men, uh, uh, at Gray knows we actually have tests for Fluentbit plugins that we have written. So we also wanna show you how to write a very simple test using the busted Lua testing framework. Now this is uh, BDD. So if you ever written BDD uh, test, this looks very, very familiar. If you've written Ginkgo and Go, Super familiar, it's the same and more or less looks like it uh, with some like nuances. Now, here we do the same thing as we uh, the actually Lua, the Fluentbit would do it, which is in line three, we load our code. Uh, we set some inputs in parameters eight to, eight to 12. And actually then we just exercise our handler in line 14. And notice that the three events we, for the sake of this example, we actually didn't care, we just wanted uh, inspect the record, which is the V in this context. And then we just assert that basically full value equals hello world. And then that's it, right? So now we're testing it and you can see in the bottom how simple it is to test, to run bust it. Now you can, which means that you can configure it with your configuration management uh, uh, Fluentbit. You can write your Lua script. You can now have tests. So you can actually wrap this into a really nice CI workflow that promotes the, the it actually not only ships your code, but you can actually have some assertion that it, with confidence that it will work. 
So definitely Buster is a really cool framework that complements the Lua filtering uh, setup. Cool, so I forgot to mention uh, earlier with the busted framework, we're also leveraging that already in gray noise uh, for a lot of the ecosystem that we have. Um, we've got a lot of uh, pretty rigid tests um, for the various open source projects um, and, and closed source stuff that we're building on top of. Uh, we've got a, a robust test framework that we've leveraged busted for and it works really well for us. So the next thing I'm gonna jump into is talking about the gray noise filter. So this was, you know, once we, started gaining that experience with Lua and learning how to leverage FluentBit in our ecosystem, we realized, hey, we could, you know, write our write a FluentBit plugin in Lua that would actually call the gray noise API itself. And so we started walking down that path to see, you know, how we could do something like that and what it would look like. And so the, the reason here that we wanted to do this is so that we could remove or deprioritize noise from your logs. And so for us, we break noise down um, in this specific plugin into three categories, which are really noise, riot, or bog on. And so noise is, you know, that passively observed scanning, someone passively observed scanning or crawling the internet. Um, in this case, you know, we're going to be looking into an SSH log on a Linux server. And what happens a lot of times is somebody just is using like an SSH brute forcer where they're scanning the entire internet um, with you know this collection of usernames and passwords, the SSH, and it isn't a targeted attack, and it generates a lot of noise that might look like some sort of attacker. When in reality, it's just you know they're they're blasting the entire internet with this brute force. And so, riots the second um, category, which stands for rule it out, and those are predefined address spaces like Googlebot or Bingbot, where you know Google or, or Bing themselves are saying hey, look, you know, these slash 24s or these subnets, these are dedicated to our bots or our crawlers. And so Gray Noise internally has um, a framework that goes out and collects um, all of those sorts of resources and constructs it in, into what we call our Riot data set. And then the third category is the Bogon category, which is private IP space. And that might be, you know, 192.168 or it might be like a multicast IP space or any IP space that doesn't, that doesn't um, uh, turn out to be public IPv4 space according to the various RFCs. So the last part is that we want, or the second part here is that we wanna route these events based on tags injected via the filter themselves. So those categories that we're getting back, we wanna say, hey, you know, we, we've extracted this IP address from a log. And then now we wanna see like, how do we route this specific event or this log line based on these tags that we've injected via the filter. And the last place, last piece is to talk about where the best place is to use this sort of filter. And so for us, we're using it on a single server, just on an SSH log or the auth log on a Linux server, because it's a good place to talk about. And it's a simple enough thing to implement and put into a small ecosystem to test. Um, but really anything that's some sort of public facing asset where you have um, you know, global inbounds allowed, um, and it might be an API or VPN or firewall itself, where you have a lot of noise there and you wanna to try to filter that down and determine uh, you know, what are these things that are targeted and how do I remove that or deprioritize that? And it's important to point out on the deprioritization that that is not, um, that it's not just dropping necessarily, and it's largely up to the user to determine well, hey, you know, I just want to send these log events to some cheaper storage or put them in S3 and keep them out of some, you know, more expensive data store. And so for us, for this gray noise filter config, one of the first things we started doing is, you know, just like Guillermo mentioned earlier, we, we need to build this config. And so we started with the input section and we uh, used a tail input plugin and we, we used the uh, SSH log that we pointed at here. And this is just an example line showing one line of log here. And here you can see, you know, somebody's blasting um, a login for user WordPress with some fake password from this specific IP address and probably doing it, you know, across a bunch of different usernames. And so we're able to take a common regex that you can find off the internet to be able to parse that message, whether it be syslog or the auth log or any sort of specific regex uh, routine. So we were able to put that into the config and able to chunk this up. And the part that we really care about is this last part in red here, where it starts with invalid user, because that's the thing that contains the IPv4 address. And so we 
extract that out and we call it message. And it's important to pay attention to that label because it's going to come up here in a minute. So uh, with a quick prayer to the demo gods, we're going to transition over uh, to a real quick demo that I'll kick off and then be able to talk in a little bit in depth about the code base there. So uh, I won't go into the exact folder uh, layout because it's pretty small here, but I'm going to go file by file. But the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and kick off the demo, which I have make targets for. I'm just going to kick off the make run rewrite because it does take a few minutes to get through. And we'll let that run in the background while we're talking about some of the files here. So that's just going to kick off the Docker file and it's going to start running uh, the Fluent Bit uh, configuration based on this rewrite comp. So what we did is we built a Docker file that contained all of the various Lua resources, um, whether it be busted or Lua requests or the caching framework itself, um, to be able to build that in isolation. So it was really easily easy to extend various libraries and continue to grow uh, that Lua script itself that we'll show here in a minute. Uh, we, we threw together a quick make file and you can see the run rewrite target that we just uh, ran here for this test. You can see we're just you know calling into Docker here and uh, we, we are targeting the rewrite config file. Looks like I had a small error there, but we'll chat about that in a second. Um, and then if we go into the rewrite config file, we can walk through this just kind of like Guillermo did earlier. And we can see up here at the top, we have a service block that designates uh, the port that the stats server itself is gonna listen on. And we'll talk about gathering stats here in a little bit. And the parsers file where that regex is located, I mentioned earlier. The next chunk again is the input section where we're using the tail input um, configuration. We're looking at that auth log, which is you know a log file, an SSH log file containing 10,000 logs, well, uh, 10,000 log lines. And then there are a few other attributes here that are available for config that we won't go into, but you can look in the details on the Fluentbit um, documentation page. And then next is our script. This is the important piece. This is us jumping into Lua at this point with uh, something pointed at a gray noise Lua file, and then specifically calling into the GN filter function. So we'll jump into that here in the gray noise Lua file here and look for GN filter. And here's our function right here. This file has a bunch of other helper functions. <clears throat> we won't go into the detail, details there, um, but just stick, stick to this GN filter function. So again, this is just the handler. We're not using tag within this handler, but we're using leveraging timestamp and record. So the first thing we're gonna do is extract the IP out of that message field. And we're using IP field here, but we actually set that via an environment variable so that we can say, okay, let's just look at that red portion, if you remember earlier, and we're gonna try to extract the IPv4 address out of there, which we do with a simple Lua match here. The next thing we do is then we take that IP address and we say, um, you know, Maybe this isn't the first time we've uh, come into this section of code. Let's first check the cache and see if we've seen that IP before. So we look in an LRU cache, which maintains, I think it's uh, 10,000, the last 10,000 records <clears throat> and also has a time-based roll off. And so if it's in the cache, great, we go ahead and return. There's no need to call out to the API and there's no need to even check if it's a valid IP or not because we have an exact record in there and we only set valid records in the cache. If it's not, the next thing we do is we go and we run a check IP routine that determines if it's a valid public IPv4 address. And if not, um, basically if it's a invalid address or if it's a bog on address, meaning it's you know one of the RFCs that covers the pri private IPv spa IP space or um, like multicast or one of the other ones that wouldn't we wouldn't normally see on the internet. So if it, if it is a valid IPv4 record, then we say, okay, let's go ahead and reach out to the gray noise um, community API. So we can see this function here that we're calling. And real quick, I'm gonna hop over to uh, gray noise, the gray noise community API documentation, just to walk through that. And so you can see here, um, there's, we have a response body that contains noise and riot booleans. And those are the only uh, fields that we really care about in this, but uh, if you're interested, you can hop on over to developer.graynoise.io and check out the free community API and some of the other uh, some of the other information you can get out of it. But for this purpose, uh, we're just going to talk about those two fields. So jumping back here, we can see that we get those two booleans out: GN noise or GN riot, and then we just return the record. Or at that point, we only return if it's invalid. 
And then the next, uh, the final step is we set that in the cache so that it's available for us the next time we come around. So it looks like our, te our uh, test finished, but before we uh, jump into that, I wanted to jump into uh, how we leverage busted tests within, with this. Guillermo talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but this is just me coming through and essentially running that check IP handler with a valid IPv4, making sure that it doesn't come back invalid and then checking it with a bog on address, making sure that it comes back bog on the same thing with link local and a few other uh, like multicast addresses, et cetera. And this is just a nice example for leveraging busted um, to get some consistency in our Lua code. Because as you start to write it, you know, the code base grows a little bit. It's good to have test coverage in here to isolate things so that you know when your issues are in Lua versus when they're in Fluentbit themselves. So finally, if we hop back over to our, um, our test, uh, it's finished now. And I can go ahead and jump over and run the stats endpoint, which curls back to that port 2020 just runs a little bash script to generate um, some metrics out of it. So I'm gonna run that just to show that it's live. And then I'm gonna jump out of this and actually go back to our slide uh, deck to talk about the results there. And so with this one, we can see we had 10,000 records, 7,704 of uh, those were noise, 6% were bog on or invalid, uh, which yielded about 77% noise. So a lot of the, traffic that was hitting this specific SSH um, and the auth log was largely noise. It took about 134 seconds and we were hitting about 75 records a second on average, which, you know, we're not winning any races here. This is uh, obviously um, just for a prototype and really just to prove out all the different moving pieces and how to go about writing um, a plugin to do IP enrichment or some of the things that we're doing here. And then Guillermo is going to talk to you a little bit about uh, where we're taking things next. Yeah, great. So as you guys see, we were extremely excited of finding out that our thesis that we had uh, of taking gray noise, putting it with Fluent Bit uh, made sense. The 77% of real noise from a real SSH log validates our uh, hypotheses. Now, so what we're looking for now is actually, how do we reduce the per IP IP requests? How do we actually can do uh, offline noise caching. And we actually went back and started looking at some of the good um, filter, uh, 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 fluent filters that, that are out there. And Matt's Mind GOIP has a really nice model that we actually are tailoring our production uh, gray noise filter towards. And the other thing is because we want, because we all use Fluent in production and we trust it and it's reliable, scalable, and performant, we're also looking at how do we make this, this plugin that you guys, they manage this demo as a native plugin. So you can also easily, now if you find yourself interested on what gray noise is doing, but also the need of reducing the noise in production, right? So we wanna make sure that it's something that uh, the community can use um, that is performing and scalable. So we actually really, really excited about this part of things and, and for the people to actually see how cool gray noise is. Um, and okay, sorry. there you go, perfect. Uh, and the last thing, the the repository that Matt mentioned, there it's already a, a, a public repository. Matt mentioned the Docker file. Uh, we actually have that image in Docker Hub, so you're actually free to use it. Not only it brings all the dependencies that he mentioned, the caching, but also brings Busted already. So if you want to just play around and use it as a means to get yourself acquainted with Busted, writing some Lua and testing, that's actually a good image to use. Um, the Gray Noise API, so as Matt mentioned, that uh, the input that we're using for this demo is actually a free community API, which is you don't even have to authenticate to actually play with it. So you just can strap curl if you just want. And more importantly, if you want to look more of the other options that the API, the Gray Noise API, uh, it's posted to you. That's a great source for you to, great resource for you to like, learn more about it. And also we found this blog post that was super helpful. And it's I and when Matt and I were like doing the slides, we we needed to put this in to a shout out of how valuable that resource was. So definitely one blog post for you to go and check it out. So awesome. Uh, so I've got some links here at the end uh, just to our Gray Noise website, our GitHub uh, repo, which has more things than just this in it. Uh, we've got a bunch of integrations and other tools that uh, we publish and hopefully more to come there to engage the community. 
um, our Gray Noise Twitter here, uh, if anybody wants to reach out or follow us on Gray Noise. Um, and then finally, our community, oops, lost or less, uh, our community Slack here at the end. Uh, you can sign up for there, uh, sign up uh, for Gray Noise Slack access there. That's our community Slack. Guillermo and I are both on there. Uh, and a quick shout out to our community manager, uh, Sapria. Uh, she can help you out on there too, uh, kind of get you engaged um, and, and maybe help answer some questions, even if it might be about this uh, Flumbit plugin. Um, so anyways, I appreciate everyone's time, uh, especially the fact that this uh, may have been a little bit clunky. Guillermo and I are very far apart today. Um, and so it was awesome. We were able to synchronize on this uh, and be able to get through this, this chat. Uh, we'll be available in the Q&A section